role here at St. Matthew as Director of Youth and Family Ministries. And so um, in that role, since faith formation is at the heart of what I do, um, Pastor Keith and I and Pastor Kevin have um, taken on the responsibility of sharing some of these teaching series, including this one. And so I was really flattered to be asked to uh, chat with you all tonight about the Apostles' Creed. Um, my teaching style might be a little different than some of my counterparts. I'm, uh, I come from a different um, era of teaching, and so um, hopefully it'll be something that's enjoyable and, and you'll get something um, good out of tonight's we'll conversation. All right, let me, yeah, just let me know if we're not. Um, one of the gifts of the day so far has been um, these Luther Small Catechisms, published in 1957. And so thanks for bringing these to our attention tonight. Um, there's a couple of them on your tables. There were just a few of them available. Do you want to get to the rest of them? No, no, I think, I think this will be great. I, I'm, we'll just reference them. Um, some of you have copies of your own, but it's just a, it's really neat to see some of these really um, well preserved. <laughs> Luther Small Catechism. So, um, You'd think they'd have been used. Yeah, the, bind, the binding is so such I don't think they um, are. They were but uh, right in but it. if, if, if you're it. curious, um, the creed, um, as Luther understood it in the Small Catechism, is on page 13. Um, and uh, I say it that way because Luther, of course, has notes. In fact, um, it's, this is known as Luther's Small Catechism with explanation. And um, what's interesting about the small cat, or excuse me, about the, the creed, um, when it comes to Luther and his writings for me in the small catechism is, Luther was not known for his brevity. <laughs> he really wasn't. <laughs> yeah, right, right, like orally or in writing. Um, he's a non-man of, of, of few words, um, but yet in the small catechism, the creed is really concise. Um, at least his explanation of it is, and, and I like that. Um, and I think from a teaching perspective, that's wonderful. But also, um, when we think about how far we've come and where we're at in our cultural history and our historic um, precedent, um, I think there, there is some opportunity for us to look at some different ways to think about the creed. And so tonight, um, we're going to use a couple different impulses, um, two videos. Um, actually a handout that I've given you, which is from a group called Core Christianity, whose theology doesn't align perfectly with ours, but has a different take on the creed that I thought there was some value in. And I want us to look at that together as well. Um, and we'll see if we can draw some things from that that are valuable. And then also, like I said, are some videos. So I want to begin with a video, um, because I have come from the Lutheran tradition my whole life. Grew up with it. I don't know how many of you have, but I was baptized Lutheran, raised Lutheran, chose Lutheran Christianity over all the other faith traditions I could have been part of. I worked at a Jewish summer camp for four summers, and uh, boy, that just reinforced my Lutheranism. You know? <laughs> so, um, but at any rate, um, I love the oral tradition of our, of our faith. Um, and I'm one of those people that really likes to listen to Scripture on Sunday morning as opposed to reading. I, I'm glad it's there. Every now and then I'll reference it, but I love listening to it. And so I wanted to begin tonight with a sharing of the Apostles' Creed um, that, that is spoken. And I, I'd love us to hear it through this lens um, or through this auditory um, sound and see what you think of it. So let's take a listen. See what we did. Was 
crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. The communion of saints. The forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body. And the life everlasting. Amen. What do you believe? So, um, not trying to sell you the book. Just wanted you to see the video. Um, but uh, the book that they promote at the end is a book about the creed um, through one person's perspective. Um, what I like is that the images and the sound um, appeal to my, my learning style. Um, I like to hear that um, spoken word of the creed. But they leave us with a question, and that is, what do you believe? And my curiosity for you tonight, um, and what I want to start with before we actually get into unpacking the creed itself is, what do you believe? As it relates to our faith, as it relates to our tradition, what do you believe? What do you believe about what we've heard and what we share about God and about Christ and about the Holy Spirit? What is it that you believe? I'm curious. Put in your own words for me for a moment. Would you automatically go to the creed? Or what would you say? Well, Elevator speech. The creed yeah. certainly makes a nice list. Yeah. Um, certainly there are, you could take each sentence of that and... Mm -hmm. Put it in something personal. Sure. Uh, but it does make a very nice list for me okay. of the, the, the rocks of my faith. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Super. Anyone else? What do you believe? Is the creed the first thing you would jump to? No. If somebody asked you about your faith? No. I'd probably go more towards the Lord's Prayer. Oh, okay. And really the only thing that's important to know is that God is the Father, Jesus is the Son, who came to save us from our sins. Okay. Anybody else? Well, um, I had a friend who was born with a disability. She was younger than I was, and that was back in the day when you had to come up to the lectern and profess sure. and you know go through all that. And she of course couldn't do that, but she wanted to be part of her class. Yep. And every time I say this story, I tear up because, I can't want to say her last name, but yeah. Kimmy got up there, which was brave enough for her, sure. and she said, Je Jesus loves me, and I love Jesus. And I thought, how simple. Yeah. You know? Yeah. How profound, <laughs> how yet profound simple, right? Was. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I've had people who have answered this question with that very phrase, that Jesus loves me, or they've sung to me, Jesus loves me, this mm -hmm. I know which I think is also a really compelling argument. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, um, we, we each, I think, could answer that in our own unique way. And, and I said briefly as I started about elevator speech, you know, sometimes we get into that moment where someone asks us what we believe, and we've only got a couple seconds to answer. You know, and, and certainly I don't know that I would go to the creed first. Um, and I'm not suggesting that, that's, that the creed is not valuable. All I'm saying is, I think when it comes down to it, how we paraphrase and what we say about who we are as people of God, and particularly as children of God in today's context, becomes really valuable, and it ought to be something you think about. The reason I share that is, I've been, I've been um, working with young people for 30 years, and my ministry has, has allowed me that opportunity, and so I've seen a number of generations, and the one thing that, that I hear young people consistently um, kind of critique when they come back from college or they, they've grown into adulthood, is they'll often say, you know, as a Lutheran t 
18, I had a lot of great experiences that really helped strengthen my faith and helped me along my own journey. But one of the things that I don't know that I got in my Lutheran tradition was a way to talk about Jesus confidently to my peers. And I've always found that interesting um, because I think sometimes the charismatic Christians maybe do this better than we do. I'm not suggesting that I agree with their theology, but it may be that they equip their people to talk about faith openly and honestly in a way that we don't. Um, and maybe that's our tradition. Maybe that's our German kind of roots and heritage or our, 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 our European roots and heritage because we weren't all Germans, of course. But, but the fact is that that we don't always equip people to do that well. And so I, I would hope that as each of us thinks about the creed and thinks about what it is that we do believe, we're able to begin to put that into words that we can share when we're confronted with that opportunity. Um, and in the best possible terms. And so I wanted to, to, to share that with you first thing tonight. And we've begun to do some things with young people over the last 10 or 12 years to help them to become more comfortable talking about their faith openly when they do get into those situations in college and beyond. So let's take a look at our creed. And um, you have two reference points there. You have the handout from Court Christianity, and you've also, in some cases, got a copy of Luther's small catechism. And um, I, I want to begin with this, with this first article. And the, the author of Court Christianity um, refers to each one of these points as articles. In other words, if you were to read this particular author's interpretation of the creed, he would or she would suggest that there are 12 articles. Luther, on the other hand, suggests there are three. And so I just want to point that out, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into this, but this idea of um, the first article of the creed, as Luther would put it, and as our author would put it, is, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Talk about creation. Talk about our own lives and how we fit into creation. What does it mean to you personally that God is our creator? What does that mean to you personally? Okay, excellent. I, I believe so, too. God does have a sense of humor. Every time I say I'm going to do something um, in ministry, God says, ah, maybe not. So, What else? What else? I believe that we are co-creators with God. Yes. I do, too. Why is that? Free will. Free will? Absolutely. What else? They always say we're his hands and feet here, so when we know what should be accomplished and what is God's will, then mm -hmm. we are the hands and feet to bring it to fruition. Okay, absolutely. Additionally, I might add that you ladies in the room, physically, are co-creators. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You have the opportunity... Um, <coughs> And it doesn't mean everyone does, and I'm not. That's not a. It's not a critique or a or a, a, a positive. It just is that that God created women with the ability to be physically co-creators. That's a fascinating part of our of our makeup and of who we are as people of God and people of Christ, um, of people of God in Christ Jesus. But I think one of the things that Luther Luther refers to. <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm not suggesting you do, but but you do a lot of the work. Yeah. So I mean, I yeah, well, just want to affirm that. Well, let's um, say we do 99. <laughs> but but Luther um, and his explanation of this article um, really wants to remind us that that what 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 this means to to Luther is that this is all of of that gifts the, all the gifts that we have come from God. That God is not only the creator of us physically and of who we are and of, of, of how we are and of our gifts, but, but of all the of all the things that we have, of all of our of all the things that we have as part of our makeup. Our um our other author mentions um, the fact that the creatures are dependent on God for existence. 
but also has the confidence of the love of God and that no, no creature or no one can separate us from our faithful Father. And of course, um, in Romans, Paul speaks to this very idea that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, Romans 8. And, and I think, you know, that, that's, that's a pretty common thread in almost any of these variations or versions of the creed that you would see written out. How do you feel about that? Do you think that's true? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Just a few head nods. God can love us, but it doesn't mean we love him. Okay. God forgives us. Where yep. we, we may not forgive others as we should, mm -hmm. but God mm -hmm. always forgives whatever we've done or said. Okay. Any others? Well, according to the Bible, when we sin, that separates us from God's love. Ah, okay. So sin can separate us. So sin can separate us. Repentance brings us back. All right. Two thoughts. One is... Repentance brings us back. I don't agree with that. But is it our actions alone that are the bridge between this love of God that we are promised and that Paul writes about or speaks of and our actions? Are the bridge our ability to live rightly with God? Our ability to repent? Is that, is that the bridge? What would you say is the bridge? Why does, why does Paul write so confidently? Nothing can separate us. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Ah, because of the blood of Christ, right? Because of Jesus' death and resurrection. In fact, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit to the second article, but, but, but Luther would suggest that nothing bought our salvation, redemption, more than the blood of Christ. He literally refers to it as the blood of Christ. He says, not gold, not silver, not, not any wealth of any kind. But what's interesting about that, and I think this is the struggle that a lot of other Christian sects have with us as Lutherans. This idea that we might somehow have bought so much into the grace that is promised us by God through the death and resurrection story of Jesus, that we might somehow have bought into cheap grace that we don't have to do a thing. And that as Lutherans, we've kind of become susceptible to that. That we've gotten to that place where, where we're just like, ah, we'll live willy-nilly, we'll sin as much as we'd like, and God will still love us. I personally don't know any Lutherans who live it that way, <laughs> frankly, but, I, but I, have, I have known some accusations of that. In fact, I've been told I've been damned because I'm Lutheran. I've been told I'm going to hell because of my beliefs as a Lutheran. And it's because of this idea that somehow we may have cheapened grace by, by suggesting that it's all about Jesus. Here, here's, here's another perspective on it, though. There are, particularly in today's culture, and I just saw a statistic today, that, that Christians in the United States are the fastest shrinking faith tradition. And I'm talking about the big picture. Not, not, not Lutherans, not Presbyterians, not Methodists, but Christians as a whole. We're the fastest shrinking faith tradition in the United States. We're the fastest growing faith tradition in Africa. Okay, so the church is not getting smaller in the world, but it's getting smaller in America. One of the challenges of that, and one of the things I've run into, is that there are a lot of folks out there who really struggle with this first article of the Creed. And not so much the belief that God is the creator, that God is almighty, but this understanding of Luther's that God loves us unconditionally through the gift of the death and resurrection of Jesus. In fact, so much so that this, this self-confidence or the lack thereof that, that so many of our particularly younger generations have about God not possibly being able to love them is very real. And I've run into older adults that feel that same way. I've sinned so badly. I've done this. I've done that. My life is so such a wreck 
that there's no way I'll go to church because God can't possibly forgive me. God can't possibly love me. I hear that all the time. And, and what I try to remind them of is this understanding that, that Luther held and that we, we kind of will get into here a little bit further into the creed that, that God's love is not based on our deeds. That God's love is not based on the actions that we're taking as much as they are based on the actions that Jesus took on our behalf. And so, as Lutheran Christians, I think we have something unique to offer the world. I think we have a, a unique perspective on grace and on love and on, and on God's love in particular that, that maybe we need to be able to talk more openly about. And so maybe this first article of the Creed is something we should be focusing on more. I don't know. Thoughts? Yeah. I, I don't remember when I came to this thought in my poor little brain, but obviously after I was a parent, I realized that there, I would always love my children, no matter what may come, I will always love them. Mm -hmm. And when we had disagreements and stuff, yeah. we always talked about it after. There was always an apology, sometimes on my part, sometimes mm -hmm. on their part. But even if that never happened, I could never separate my mm -hmm. love for my child. And when I think I can do that, how much more glorious the Father is in his love for us. We just can't even imagine. But now I know people with, that have trouble with the Father image because they sure. didn't have a good experience with their father. And that's, that's in my own family, and I don't get it because I thought my dad was great. But it's just, it's, it's too big for our brains to comprehend, truly. But the love is always there, always, no matter what comes. Yes, please. Do we get, could we get love and light mixed up? <laughs> okay, <laughs> say more. I'm thinking... He loves us, but he probably it's like your children. You don't always like him. Okay. But you don't give up on him. Right. You keep puts up with some of our behavior. Yeah, he does, and like just as we would put up with our children, mm -hmm. I mean, like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's part of what some people can't believe that God loves us because mm -hmm. they confuse it with like. Mm -hmm. Could be. I don't know. What what I find interesting about this this discussion, and whenever we, whenever I'm talking about the creed with with other peers and adults, and even among pastors, um, what one of the things that's interesting culturally for us um, is as we um, begin to be a church to a world that is less and less in our camp as it relates to Christianity, um, it's harder for folks to proclaim these words aloud in the context of our faith communities. In other words, if somebody walks in off the street to a Lutheran worship and the creed is part of that liturgy, um, I think sometimes the, this, this creed in particular causes them to balk a bit. Um, and and that's, there's a couple reasons for that. One is they're probably seeing those words very differently than we are because we've recited them so often. In fact, there are some folks who would say that in many ways the creed has become a, a recitation for us and not truly something we're confessing or not truly something that we are, 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 are speaking. But a couple, couple reasons why. This word is a stumbling block for a lot of folks nowadays. Um, and, and, I, and I, I mean, we could have just a, in fact, there are whole courses on that now, <laughs> okay? I'm not going to go into that too deeply tonight because that, that can, that, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of emotion and psychological understanding wrapped up in that, okay? But that's one of the, that's one of the stumbling blocks. But, but also this understanding that, that God's love is so expansive that God could be including me, even broken me. And so what I always want to remind us of is that if someone's not really willing to embrace our creed instantly, it doesn't mean that they're not searching and genuinely interested in wanting to know more about Jesus. Genuinely interested in wanting to know more about this, this love of God that we speak of. Genuinely interested in finding out what it is that, that is so appealing to us that we keep coming back to this community of faith. I think they want to genuinely learn those things, but they may not be quite ready to, to recite the creed. And so as they begin to experience 
the love that we're talking about, as they begin to understand the blessings of forgiveness, grace, mercy that we speak to, then they might be more inclined to, to read it or to speak it. So with that, let's look at that love, grace, and forgiveness. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. In our author's article, this would be his, the second article, but for Luther, this is simply the beginning of the second article. Because for Luther, this whole portion of the creed devoted to Jesus is part of the second article for Luther. And Luther really gets into this understanding of Christ being the redemptive mechanism for our, our grace, forgiveness that we're promised by God. And so um, our author would suggest that, um, that, Christ's, that Christ's presence in our lives, that Christ's promise of love, that Christ's witness of, of grace and forgiveness is, is what we should be reading into this. But for me, I wonder, um, do any of you have any doubts about this portion of the creed? Be honest. I realize that, that sometimes it's tough for adults because we've come to a certain stage of our lives to be honest with other adults about the things that we're really not sure about. I'd be curious. Do you believe this one? Do you believe that? Wholeheartedly. Okay. That is the Good. basis of Christian right. faith. Right on. Now, All right. If you don't God's believe children. that, then you okay. believe in a different religion. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Honestly. I ask that because as we go deeper into this second article in Luther's understanding, there are pieces of this article that become the real kind of, I think, um, the biggest stumbling block of all for some of our peers, whether they're in the Lutheran church or not. But for me, I'm, I'm like you. This, this portion of it got no problem. I mean, not only do I not have a problem with it, I, I would absolutely agree with this. For me, but I, but I think that well, again, what we need to be open-minded enough to understand is that people who are searching and trying to understand this love, this this love of God, this love of Christ, more completely, may not be there yet. And one of the criticisms of American Christianity is that we don't talk enough about this. Let that sink in a moment. One of the biggest knocks on Americanized Christianity is we don't talk enough about this. That we're so caught up in kind of, and, and this is not any, I, I, there's no one in the room's fault. <laughs> okay, so please don't hear me <laughs> making any kind of critiques here. But, but in, many, in many ways, American Christianity has been tied to social agendas, political agendas. Right and left, wrong and right, and in many ways we've we've gotten so into this idea of what it means to be Christian and and what that looks like, and made it about us, as opposed to making it about Jesus. And one of the critiques I hear is that we we still don't talk enough about Jesus, particularly as Lutheran Christians. And again, I think some of that goes back to the whole idea that we, we don't talk much about our faith in public anyway. But, but, it, but I'm much more inclined to be sure that people know that this is something that I believe by the way I live my life. I'm not saying I always live up to it. Okay? Right? That's another story. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. Believing in the creed, yep. reciting the creed and believing it mm -hmm. does not believe. That's just your belief. Right. I don't believe that's what's going to get me into heaven. I right. need to do more than just believe. I need right. to live. Right. That's another story. Yeah, and, and I think the living part is, is challenging, but I try to do that in a myriad of ways. And so what, what I've learned, particularly about Lutherans, is that when, I, when I've encountered folks who have gotten to know Lutherans on a deeper level, but they come from another faith tradition, many of them will say, you know, you don't talk much about Jesus but I sure do see a lot of Jesus in the way you act. 
In other words, we live it sometimes pretty well, but we don't always talk about it, right? And, and, and where that has most manifested itself is in situations where Lutherans have gone into places that are recovering from natural disasters, where poverty is rampant, where we can, where we can hit the ground and walk with a company, the big word, people as they go through life's tragedies, challenges, and so forth. Recovery programs. We've got some fantastic Lutheran recovery programs that are happening all around us. And so that's where they witnessed Jesus lived out through us. But there's still, be, there's, there's still sometimes a critique that we don't, we don't talk enough about Jesus as a broad spectrum. We're supposed to live our faith and mm. show it. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, God, Lord, would mm -hmm. want us to do help our fellow human beings. That's yeah. why we're here to Amen. be servants. Yep. Yep. To yep. help the other so I guess if we're not saying enough of this, why Right. Well, and I and I, I would can all I'm, all I'm all I'm wanted you to understand about that is, and we we do that. We do a lot. I do a lot of leadership development with young people, and we try to help them identify the gifts that they've been gifted with at their baptism that God has given them, and how they live those gifts out in service to the kingdom in the manner of Jesus. Yeah. Right. And so we we do a lot of that kind of work with them. But what I guess I'm suggesting is, I just want us to to always keep in mind that that the more we're able to, I think, put our faith into practice, but also into language that, that, that sometimes we could help ourselves a little bit, I think, in that, that regard. That is, that yeah. is, it's hard, though. It is hard. See, mm -hmm. I can confess my faith to somebody, right. especially somebody who doesn't believe. Mm -hmm. Where I fall short is when they attack me and yeah. my beliefs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I just shrivel into myself and I'm like, why can't I find the right words? Why can't mm -hmm. I turn them? Why can't I make them see? Yeah. It, it, it may be that nobody can make them see. I, I don't well, think it has anything to do with me personally, but sure. I just kind of take it with, I'm not a very good Christian. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. I could not defend myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've had people laugh. I, I, I can remember a man I worked with, he laughed at me when I said, we have a, uh, we have baptized members and confirmed members. I mean, he, he laughed at yeah. me. Like, yeah. what do you mean? Yeah. Well, this very idea of baptizing children. Oh, yeah, that was part of it because he was... Right. He was, yeah. We get criticism about that all the time. But that's and, more of a parent's promise than... I mean, the child is blessed through baptism. But it's more of a parent's promise. Don't look for the parents, I think. It's the parents promising yeah. what they're going to do to raise that child in faith. And that doesn't always mean just bringing them to Sunday school and church. Mm -hmm. It means teaching them at home, practicing it, praying, sure. you know, having them volunteer to do things. Yeah. And when you're attacked, sometimes I wonder if it's not because people are just afraid to hear it. Kind of goes back to the first one that you Indeed. said. Yep. Uh, a lot of people who don't think they're worthy is because they are so broken themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, mm -hmm. when I went to the ED, I saw people the worst times of their life. Yeah. And I remember one man who was in there. His son was going to die. There was he was son underdosed. He was going to yeah. die. There was nothing we could do to save him. Mm -hmm. And he goes, "I don't know what to do." Sure. And I said, "You know, about praying." And he goes, "It's been so long. God yeah. probably wouldn't hear me, and I really don't remember how to pray." So I said, God's going to hear you. I said, yeah. let's pray together. Oh, but, that's a great but, you know, great I, offer. I mean, there's people like that that they're just, they just don't know anymore. They think there's a formula to prayer, yeah. which right. is some of the religions, that's kind of how you're brought up. But I would recommend to anyone, if you want to have some arguments in your, in your toolkit, to watch the movie uh, or read the book, The Case for Christ. It's a true story of an investigative reporter that was found and determined to disprove the sovereignty of Jesus Christ that he ever existed because his wife got back into her faith. And oh my gosh, he was vicious. He was vicious, but she never gave up. And he literally traveled the world. <laughs> and what do you think happened? He, he became a believer. 
and also the very first um, God's Not Dead movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, yeah. that the arguments that he that kid has to uh, do to prove yeah. his point that God is not dead. That movie is based on 37 cases that were in court at the time of students against universities. And I think we have that in the library, don't we, Felicia? <laughs> I think it, it might be over there. I, I, I will say this. I think people witness, people who are, are questioning or doubting faith often witness the gospel through us. And, and one of the things I've, I've kind of tried to get into the habit of is when, is when I'm in one of those situations where um, I say, I'll, um, I'll pray for you. If, if I'm in a place where I can do it, I'll not only say that, I'll invite them to allow me to pray for them on the spot. Right on the screen. And, it's, it's and that's unique. so overpowering, because I've oh, had that done. Oh, yeah, before. right. My husband and I have that done two times for us. Okay. It's powerful. It is. I mean, it gives me chills just sure. think. I mean, one time it was at a, a garden center, and the next time it was at a, at the, a roadside rest. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating. And, and I think what's interesting about that is when I start to pray, um, because I speak to God the way I'm speaking to all to all of you, my, my prayers are not structured. My prayers are not, um, you know, something from out of a textbook. They're 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 a conversation with God. And I think some of what happens is people start to realize it's okay that I don't have all the right words. That maybe God's still listening, even if if what I'm if all I'm doing is is, is trying to confess and and thank and relate. To what's happening in my life or the lives of the people I'm praying for them. I think God gives you the words. Oh, I do too. God, the Holy Spirit. Yes, yeah. And it's okay to be angry with God. I have trouble ah, with God. Yeah. It's okay to be angry, but a lot of times if I start out angry, mm -hmm. I end up with gratitude. Well, and and, and I, I would agree with that. And I would, I would, one of the questions I had for you later in the evening, and maybe this is a better time for it, is... Do you, do you think God gets angry with us or loves us less when we begin to question God? Let's not even go angry. Let's go, I just are you real? One day, and he tells me the more, the more you start to question, the deeper your faith will become. Okay. I didn't quite get that because sometimes I don't think that. I know we had a, uh, a grief share. We had someone who looked at us one day and he goes, you know, God needs us more than we need him. So I said, well, what do you mean by that? He goes, if we didn't believe in God, he wouldn't be there. <laughs> okay. Which, logically, it wow, makes I, sense. It, it, but, you know, we do need God because... It's, I would disagree with that one. But, but, but go ahead. I mean, well, yeah, in, yeah. in a logical sense, that to me, that yeah. you could apply that. Although, I don't see how anybody could. Um, but... I think we need, well, I mean, we all know we need God. If we don't have God, and I, I think everybody has some kind of a belief that there's something, maybe not our God, but you wouldn't be able to even take a breath. Mm -hmm. I mean, you wouldn't have the pretty things. Yeah, th things are going to be horrible at times, and I do look at him and I ask him, excuse me, but what the hell are you doing up there? <laughs> you know? Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, and, bowling? Uh, yeah, bowling. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do think that there are moments in our lives where we go through those, those kind of situations where we're going, what, what, what's going on here? Like, what, what are you up to, God? Or, or what, what was that about? Or even angry with God. And so I, I want us to be careful that in our own humanity we don't begin to, 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 to believe for a moment that, that we have it all together because so often we begin to question. We begin to... to, to maybe get even angry with God. And I don't, I don't know that God loves us less in those moments. I think God wants to embrace us more in those moments and help us to see revealed in our lives and in the people around us the, the existence of God through Christ really by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Stop. Well, I, I, you know, so many times I've, I've had young people that were really immersed in their faith in high school. They go away to college, first year or two, they start to question everything. I mean, literally everything. And they'll come back at Christmas break and they'll say, Charlie, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist now. I'm like, okay, tell me more about that. And we'll talk, you know, and I'll listen. And I won't, I won't judge, I'll just listen. And I'll, and I'll remind them that I believe that God loves them unconditionally and, and all the things we've taught, and I'll let, it, I'll let it go, which is hard to do. 
right? When you're, when you're a faith mentor, it's hard to do that. But more often than not, they'll come back around because what, what's been happening is they've started to get into dialogue about what, what's going on in their lives with others, and they begin to wrestle with God, which is biblical, right? Plus the educational component doesn't help. Sure. And so they, but, they'll, but, but so often God is working through those conversations. God is working through those questionings. And I think that's hard for us to, to allow for, that perhaps God really does work in those moments when we're, when we're being... Most tested. Now, I'm. I will. I'm going to make sure. I want to be clear here. I don't believe God put. I don't believe God puts tests in our lives to make our faith strong. I don't believe that. I believe in a loving God that loves us through those moments and creates opportunities for us to witness God's action in those moments of stress. But that doesn't mean we as human beings don't question anyway. Well, so she, oh, I'm sorry. Please. It's like she said. If you. She didn't know what to say, but if you get one thing taken away from that conversation, and usually any conversation, there's going to be one thing somebody's going to remember that you said. Sure. That's all you need to plant that seed, just that one idea. I don't know, it's more than that. I had yeah. a niece who yep. loved God, went away to retreats. Yeah, yeah. She was into it. Yep. She went to college, and she came home, and she is one. Nasty individual. Ah, okay. She is full of hate and yep. anger. I cannot have a conversation with her. She yep. screams at me. She wow. doesn't talk to me. She okay. screams at me now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and we now have we were really close. She would come to me when she couldn't go to her parents. Yeah. And now she won't she won't even speak to me. She studies she studies psych. My degree is psychology. My degree is psychology. Yeah. So we had so many wonderful yeah. conversations about all that. It was when she announced that she no longer believed in God. It's mm -hmm. almost like she has a part of evil coming out of her. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I see this, but I have, uh, I've kind of been taken away yeah. from or she took herself out of my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's been vacant now for several years. I mean, it's wow. it's, it's sad. Mm -hmm. and, he, and I'm seeing no, she's well, she's going back now with masters, second masters, yeah. whole other story. Yeah. But I see people in her age group that mm -hmm. I play with, and and they all pronounce that they do not believe in God. Mm -hmm. Religion is for the weak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's yeah. what they say. Religion is for the weak. And yet, our faith is, is one that you really have to almost struggle with your whole life. <laughs> it, it hardly can be weak. Yeah, it, it's actually, you know, it's a, it, our faith is a faith of tension. This idea of sinner saint, this idea of, of, of how can we, you know, how can we give over um, the, the control to, to, to a loving God and suggest that maybe Jesus is the one whose actions on our behalf is really the salvific event of our lives. Th those are all kinds of things for me that create that tension that, that make faith challenging and, and vibrant. And, but, but, I, but I think from your story, one of the things that, that I can take away that, that I've experienced so often is temptation is strong. Evil is strong. The Holy Spirit is probably not the only spirit at work, is it? Oh, wow. You know? And so... Um, how can, how can we, um, in those moments when we know that someone who, who we love deeply is being pulled by that tempting force towards something that we know or we believe not to be true, how do we, how do we love them back to life, right? How do we witness God in Christ Jesus in ways that allows them the, 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 the opening to discover for themselves that love again? the behavior component you have to show them because nothing you're going to tell them is going to work yeah I, yeah i think it, well i would agree with that but I, I do think it's both in i think it's being able to articulate it as well not being right. afraid if, to say if you don't have relationships if, correct if, if i've not seen her in two years so how can she right. learn anything from my behavior right there right. has the relationship to be dialogue broken. and it's like i almost feel like i need a class on on how to be a good disciple how to Relate to people mm -hmm. who don't believe. Interesting. How to believe. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's. We'll footnote that on the video, Pastor Keen. <laughs> we need this episode back. All right, let's 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 go let's go forward a little bit. Um, I want to make sure we get through. So, Jesus was conceived 
by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead in Luther's tradition to hell. Yes. And there's some stories about that. This is where I've been waiting oh, all okay. this time. All right. <laughs> oh, and you look have, at him smile because he's not teaching. You have a query, I would, I would Yes, say. I do. Okay. We were always saying to hell. Then yep. we started doing to dead. Mm -hmm. Well, to dead, that means to me that all the loved ones I have died are not just laying there in their graves sleeping until God comes back for them, until Jesus comes back for them, but they're all sitting in heaven being tortured, or in hell being tortured. I mean, the word dead is very kind of condescending. Okay, all right, all right. Um, other thoughts on that? One of, the, one of the explanations for hell that was commonly held um, is that Christ went through hell to free the souls who had gone before. In other words, if we understand Jesus' death and resurrection to be the redeeming act, the redemptive act that frees us from, or, or that, that, that wins God's loving grace, salvation for us, the promise of grace and salvation from God, if that's the act that does it for us, those who, were, who had died prior to that act, that Christ's journey through hell was that freeing experience. That's one of the explanations that was given. Um, I think partly why we've moved to this is we're looking for sanitized versions of it. I don't like sanitized. <laughs> now, that's, a, I'm just, that's one opinion. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's true or not. I'm just giving you an opinion. But in many ways, we, you know, we've moved some of our language on a variety of things. Yes. Um, and I think part of that's because of Again, it's an Americanized version of Christianity. So we're PC and things, which really well, maybe, maybe, I'm not, it, that's what may not be that simple. But, right. Who wrote, Who wrote the creed? Yeah. Oh, that's a nice idea. Yeah, it was it was a it was a it was a group of leaders, church leaders, yeah. who got together and wanted to give a profession of the beliefs of the basic beliefs of Christianity, and they constructed a number of creeds. Seven. Uh, seven? I'm not sure about it. Oh, it's familiar. Now, now you're now you're out of my league. That's that not, could be. I'm not, I, I will be honest. I'd, I'd have to research that. There's a, I'm thinking of four off the top of my head. Four. According to this book, there's four. That's the four. The four. That's the four that I'm aware of. But there may be more. So I'm we, sorry, I'll find, I'll because find out. Because the one in the back, I I'll research that. I never even heard of. So we don't really know who wrote it specifically. It was more of a group effort. It was a group. It was yeah. a group of Christian leaders of their day. Mm -hmm. and, you know, what year? <laughs> oh, I should not make Google. Yeah, that's a that's another one. I'm not. I don't know the answer to. I think the Council of Nicaea was 386, Three, but don't it's quote. It's in me. that range. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was prior to the 400s. Sure. Church so history is not my strong suit. Early, early days of the mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. yep. There was so much dissension in the, uh, between Christian sects on what, how it should be written, what should be written, and right. so they stand. They try to standardize it. Constantine's son would be about that time period. Well, would have been, been that period, yes. Yeah. And and see, I mean, and here again, and this is this is where we do get into some really challenging like waters because we're still talking about human beings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. constructing what we know to be the the tenets of our faith including Luther and other and others later in, in time but but the point is the the construction of the understanding of who or who we become as a church was really constructed by humans and so anytime we can go back to the basics of our understanding of faith, from what we've learned from Jesus directly or in the biblical narrative, that's, that's where we tend to ground ourselves. That's why, that's why for, for Luther so much of Scripture was so critical, Sola Scriptura, was, was this idea that it's, it's, it's scriptural, then, it, then that's the Word of God, the inspired Word of God. Um, um, and so I think the challenge for us is, when we start to drift too far into is this right or wrong based on whoever wrote it, 
that's where your narratives can be can be can be clouded a bit. And so when the more we can be pulled back to something that's kind of we know to be true or that we believe to be true, that's that's what gives people comfort. And so that's partly why our liturgy is the way it is. There's a comfort in that. That we're that we're sharing the word of God aloud in in liturgy, in worship, and repeating those words that we were given or that we know to be scriptural or of God. So yes, Pastor Keith. Um. I was off by a year. According to Wikipedia, the first council in Nicaea was 325. I said 326. Sorry. We'll you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I want to. I want to get to this next slide. The last. The last portion of the third article. What. What our author of our of our handout would refer to as the fourth article, I believe. Um, is this understanding of Jesus' resurrection? The fifth article for our for our other author. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come to judge the living and the dead. The reason that I want to just spend a moment on this portion of it, before we go, go to the final article of the Creed, and we're, we're, we're having such a great conversation, time is just escaping us, but is that this is the portion of the Creed, for many of the young people I've worked with over the years, that is the hardest part to, to fathom. Why? Resurrection. The resurrection. The resurrection is the hardest thing for the for the conscious mind, I believe, for most human beings to really get their mind around, to grasp, to believe. It's it's that piece where um, where the, the struggle really is is the most prevalent. And I, I've had I've had people say to me, Charlie, I, I'm a faithful Christian. I go to church. I try to live a a, a life that's worthy of. Of, of, of Christ, but here's where I really here's where I really struggle. And yet, is Christ the only person in the Bible that we have a resurrection story of? No, Lazarus. And others. And if God creates, why can't he Peter, with that? Peter, yeah, right. Peter even has there's resurrection um, that's attributed to Peter. I mean imagine that. Having the power of Christ so, so powerful through you, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, that you might actually be able to, you know, live into a resurrection story of your own. So, it, it, I, I just share that because as we're talking about beliefs and what we understand and what we, what we say and what we believe, this is, this is a portion that I think for some folks is tough. And that's, that's okay. It really is okay. I'm not suggesting that if someone was to say to me, Charlie, I just don't believe Jesus rose. I don't. I would. I would want to have some conversation about that. Okay. But but the fact is, I get it. I mean, as a, as a human being, I understand people's conscious kind of roadblock to that. Um, but yet, without this, what happens to the story? It crumbles. Right. It's it's. It's, it's pretty hard to, to believe that, that this powerful prophet and teacher was anything more than that. And so it is a really significant part of, of, the, of the creed and of our belief and understanding. And so because I want I want I want to skip over the Holy Spirit, because Lord knows the Holy Spirit is critical, but, but, I, but at the same time, let's just for a moment, have a, have a conversation about, about this very piece of belief. And I want to ask you, what's the difference between belief and faith? And why is it significant to have both? Belief is something basically that's taught to people. Faith is, is the believing of something unseen that nobody can prove to you. Okay. Other thoughts? I don't know. I'm going to pick, uh, piggyback on what she said. It was Belief was something that's taught. And yep. faith is something that's it's a personal journey that you go okay. through right. um, yep. to make your belief stronger. Okay. Um, yeah. 
and sometimes a communal journey as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, first I think, you know, I, I believe that Christ rose again. When I have no proof, I have to believe it by faith. Okay. Yeah. All right. Others? Okay. Say more. It's my faith in God mm -hmm. that makes my belief so strong. Okay. No, no, I, I, I think mm -hmm. you know, I. Yeah. Yes, please. Have, have you ever heard about the God gene? What? The God gene. That some people are genetically predisposed to believe in God, and some people are not, depending on their gene makeup. Okay. I just wonder if you ever heard of it. I hadn't. I read something on that many years ago. Okay. Not that I believe in it, but it's yeah. it's something to think about. Hmm. Intriguing. Okay. If God's the creator, why would God empower some with the God gene and others not? Doesn't they already say God knows who's going to be saved and who who isn't? He already yeah. knows that. He has to know it somehow. <laughs> so, so when we're when I'm when I'm with folks who say, I don't know about this rising, the resurrection piece. I just I, I can't get my mind around the resurrection piece. Some some of the time, some of my conversation with them will lead us. To this kind of discussion. Why? They're, they're usually someone who has pretty strong beliefs as it relates to the story, our understanding of who we are as people of God. They believe in God as creator. They believe that Jesus existed. They believe that 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 Jesus is reflection of love and grace and forgiveness is a way to live their lives. They're struggling with the understanding that Christ may be, may be rose. And that's when we talk about this idea of faith. Are there things that we struggle to believe, but that we have to offer faith in, in order to allow that maybe God knows more than we do? <laughs> right? Perhaps it's not about what I think. In fact, I read an article recently that said um, it's not don't believe everything you hear anymore, it's don't believe everything you think. <laughs> All right? Because we've kind of run to that in our culture. But is it possible that there are things that are beyond our comprehension? Oh, oh, yeah. that, in, that a God of creation, that a God that is that it has God's hand in all of it might actually have some things that God has answers to that we don't. And might the rising of a human who is God and human in one be one of those things. That God is triune. Father, Creator, Son and Holy Spirit in one. Try to try to explain that one to a non-Christian, yeah. right? I, right. I struggle explaining that. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> we bring people back to life all the time with technology that we didn't have 60 years ago. Ah, yeah. okay. So yeah, if right. through technology we're able to do that, how much more can God do something? Correct. And so it's often, it's often that when, when I'm having those discussions with the non-believer, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting this always works, but what I'm saying is oftentimes, or somebody who's doubting their faith, maybe it's a better, more appropriate, that it's sometimes not as much about what I believe as, as what do I have faith in? Do I, do I have faith in the fact that God is being, it is, is the loving God that God pretends to be? That a God that would send God's only son, that God would sacrifice God's only child on our behalf, and particularly as a parent, I think this is this is something that parents could really internalize. It that I might have to give over to the fact that I don't know it all, <laughs> right? 
that I'm, there, there may be some things that are beyond my comprehension, but I have faith that God's promise of salvation, God's promise of forgiveness on behalf of Christ's death and resurrection, on my behalf, is enough. And, and I, I do believe that that's part of the dialogue, part of the conversation. One of the things that I've always found profound, and we are getting a little short on time here, is this idea, and I, and I think for me it's, it's one of the really unique things about our, our understanding of our faith tradition, is this communi communion of saints. This idea that, that we are um, in community with fellow believers is so powerful for Luther and many of the authors of that time. That this understanding of the Lutheran Christian tradition is, is that while, while there is a, a personal nature to our faith, that really our faith is, is, um, is more profoundly lived out when we are in community. In other words, that, that when, and, and, I, and I've looked at it this way, when I am weak, when, when I am at that vulnerable spot where, where either temptation or anger or disbelief or frustration or whatever is starting to take over, that because I'm surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, both alive and beyond, that are part of that communion, part of that community that I'm a part of, that that is the moment when God is acting through those brothers and sisters in Christ because of the gift of the Holy Spirit that dwells within them to keep me in a, in a faithful place, to keep me in a, in a place of comfort and healing. Because it, it's so often the case that, and I, I, can, the, I always point back to the story, I was working, I've always um, kind of had one foot in the fitness industry my whole adult life, and I actually owned a gyms at one time, and I had two um, co-owners of my fitness facility that were, bo that were both atheists. One was more agnostic, but, but they, neither one of them really believed in God. Um, and so I went in to the gym the morning after Katrina struck New Orleans. And some of you are old enough to remember Hurricane Katrina and the flooding that resulted as a result. So um, there was a lot of narrative in the press following Hurricane Katrina that God was somehow wiping, cleaning that sinful city off the map. Right? You remember that narrative? That was really pretty prevalent at that time. And so I walk into the gym the next day, and one of my, one of my co-owners says to me, so what do you think of your God now? And I'm like, oh. and, it, and we had to go through this whole like unpacking of, of God is love, and God would not send this storm. And, 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 and really, for me, and the way I helped them understand what I believe, was what we what we practice and live and teach as Lutheran Christians, and that's this. That through the gift of God's Holy Spirit, that Christ is incarnational. We don't worship a Christ that hangs on the cross, right? We worship a Christ that's risen. We have empty crosses in our, in our, in our spaces for a reason. That we believe that Christ did rise, and that Christ is incarnational through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's just a big word to say that Christ is lived out through you and I, through our words, our actions, our deeds, when we're at our best. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that we're always doing it, but that's this whole kind of narrative that is this tension for Luther between sinner and saint, this idea that somehow we might be capable of the greatest sins, the most incomprehensible acts, but also capable of Christ-like behavior, of healing, of the power of, of prayer, okay, of all those different things that we're capable of doing. And so what I reminded my partners of was that God wasn't, God was in that storm, but wasn't the one bringing that storm. That storm was, was a result of of the human condition of brokenness that we live with all the time, like any storm is. But in the midst of that storm, you were also hearing all the stories of rescue, all the stories of compassion, all the stories of people living out faithfully. And as a result of that, God was present, bringing hope to a place that felt hopeless in that moment. And boy, did we witness that firsthand when we went there for the next six years as the ELCA to walk with those people 
um, through the EOSA Youth Cat. So it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that this idea of Holy Spirit, which again is something we don't always talk a lot about in the Lutheran Church, but that we believe, we attest to in this creed, is something that we have to put what in? More belief or more faith? Faith. <laughs> yeah, faith, I think. I mean, we can believe it, we can talk about it, but for me, I think it's a lot about this understanding that we have to, we have to faithfully admit that perhaps God is working through us. Thoughts? I have one yeah, please. short story. Um, yeah. One of my sisters that has a very hard time with God loving her, every time something goes wrong, she's like, oh, God hates me. And she had gone with another sister to a friend's house for a Seder meal. Mm. And... Um, mm. When they got there, and they did, really did the place up nice to look like a tent and, and everything. Mm -hmm. And the hostess's son had autism, pretty severe autism. But he he was part of the group, no problem. He shouted out sometimes some inappropriate things. But afterwards, he was introduced to my sister that has the real problem with God. Mm -hmm. And when he was introduced to my sister, <clears throat> he took her hands and looked her straight in the eye and said, when I look at you, I see God smile. Wow. Everybody in the room just went, and and then he was back to whatever. So you just, you God uses everybody. Oh, gosh. That, that, that just still yeah. gives me chills. That still mm -hmm. gives me chills. Um, to kind of bring this to a encapsulation <laughs> as much as we can. Um, I would agree with that. And I think you'll hear me talk a lot, whether it's with teenagers or even with adult groups, about this understanding of, of, of seeing and experiencing Christ in every day. In fact, the, 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 the series that we're doing right now, we did during Advent as well, this, this Lenten photo a day or an Advent photo a day challenge, we call it, is this, is this challenge to be kind of more aware of the way God shows up in your life, of the way Christ is incarnate in your life. And so what I try to challenge people to do, particularly teenagers, is what are the God moments? What are the, where are the places where you see or experience God or Christ in your everyday? If, the more we begin to look for those, the, the deeper the relationship is between us and Jesus. The deeper the relationship is between us and God. And, and the reason I can confidently say that is because I really believe there are people in our lives who are the, are the presence of Jesus. Like, you know when you're in their presence, you're like, oh my gosh, I love being with them because they remind me, that there's something about them, right? We, that's, that's our saying. There's something about so-and-so, you know? There's something about Keith um, or, or whomever, you know, there, that, that is that presence of Christ for us. And it may, be, it may be different people at different moments. There may be times when we're, when we're in, a, in a place of grieving, and we just need that healing that, that, that someone brings to that moment, whether it's in a prayer or a touch or a, or a smile. And, and, and I really, truly believe that that's how strong the Spirit is, that God's Holy Spirit does act in, the, in our midst every day of our lives. We just don't always look for it. Like, we don't notice it. It's happening all the time, all around us. We just don't notice it. But the more you hone that skill, the more you begin to look for it and expect God to show up, the more you'll see it. Right? Any other thoughts or questions? Probably a lot, and I hope so, because I always want to leave you with more questions than answers. But as, yeah, right, there's not enough time. Like I said, there's whole courses written about this stuff, right? So I want to close um, with our little, our little Luther's Catechism. Luther wrote two prayers. Well, more than that, but the two that appear here. The morning and evening prayers of Luther, and I'd like us to close with, with, uh, with Luther's evening prayer. It's on page 85. And um, if you're someone who wants to speak these words loud with me, you might. You want to just listen or be prayerful about it? Um, you're welcome to do that as well. It's uh, Luther's evening prayer on page 85. Okay. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I give thanks unto thee, Heavenly Father, through Christ Jesus, thy dear Son. 
that thou hast this day so graciously protected me, and I beseech thee to forgive me all my sins and the wrong which I have done. And by thy great mercy, defend me from all the perils and dangers of this night. Into thy hands I commend my body and soul and all that is mine. Let thy holy angel have charge concerning me that the wicked one has no power over me. Amen. Thank you. There's, there's I think we really forget about the devil and the evil. Oh, yeah. I mean, so much so that we don't really. Yeah. We sort of like push that yeah. to the side. And it's, it's, it's very, very prevalent oh, in our yeah. culture today. The, the tug of, of evil is really present. What, what are we doing next week? What are we doing next week, Pastor Keith? Sacraments. The sacraments. The sacraments. And next week, because of a schedule conflict for this room, this group will be meeting in the nave. Oh, okay. The First Communion um, workshop for children is going to be happening in here. So, so you guys are going to be down in the nave, which I think is entirely fitting to be discussing the sacraments. So, right, right. Both Pastor Shep. Sorry? Both sacraments. Yes. Yeah, both sacraments at once. Yes. Yeah. Thank you all. Appreciate you coming out. I hope it was informative. Somebody just asked about these. As long as you bring them back, I guess you can take them home.